Okay, and we're live on YouTube. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Multnomah County's first public hearing on our fiscal year 2024 budget. I'm Jessica Vega Peterson, your Multnomah County Chair, and I want to thank you all for joining us here this evening to share your thoughts and priorities. Before we start, I want to let everyone know that interpretations of this hearing are available in American Sign Languages, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, and Somali. You should be seeing a screen right now with information on the phone numbers you can call to access those interpreters. You can also find that information in the description of our YouTube live stream. If you are streaming on YouTube, but would like to watch the hearing with an ASL interpreter, please email our board clerk right now at boardclerk at maltco.us to receive a link to our WebEx platform, which allows you to pin the ALS interpreters window to your screen. And that email address is also um, on, the, on the card in front of you. Alternatively, you may also consider using YouTube's live closed captioning function. Interpreters, as I call your name, please introduce yourself. Carolina Loza Delgado for Spanish. Good evening, my name is uh, Carolina and tonight I am here to interpret this budget hearing in Spanish. Si desea escuchar esta audiencia en español, por favor, marque. El código de participante 2830310. Um, si va a testificar esta noche, por favor, déjeme saber que voy a interpretarle y deje saber a la secretaria de consejo antes de que usted empiece a testificar. Gracias. Great. Thank you, Carolina. The next interpreter is Yelena Krushkova for Russian. Добрый вечер, меня зовут Елена, и сегодня вечером я здесь, чтобы переводить это слушание о бюджете на русский язык. Если вы хотите прослушать это слушание на русском языке, пожалуйста, наберите номер телефона 888-363-4734. Когда вас попросят ввести код участника, введите номер 911-8696. Если вы даете показания сегодня вечером и хотите, чтобы я перевела для вас, пожалуйста, сообщите заранее, чтобы секретарь совета был в курсе, прежде чем вы начнете давать показания. Спасибо. Thank you, Yelena. For um, and we have Dennis Lam for Vietnamese. Ngân sách này sang tiếng Việt ngữ. Nếu bạn muốn nghe phiên điều trần này bằng tiếng Việt, vui lòng quay số 888-557-8511. Khi bạn được yêu cầu nhận nhập mã, người tham gia vui lòng, vui lòng nhập 298-5289. Nếu bạn đang làm chứng tối nay và muốn coi phiên dịch cho bạn, vui lòng cho thư ký hội đồng quản trị biết trước. Khi bạn bắt đầu lời khai của mình, cảm ơn bạn. Over. Thank you, Dennis. We have Bishar Noor for Somali. Garab wa naksan maga aida wa Bishar Noor. Hanar khan aaku joga in an turjuma daga isi gan haga kharashka loqad Somali gan ku turjuma. Haddi as dewna isa in lugu turjuma daga isi gan lugu turjuma loqad loqad Somali gan lugu turjuma. Fadna wa xasawa da telefon ka sidet sidet sidet. Laba Tadaba Siddet, Laba Abar Laba, Sagal Lih, Kedibin Waha Sog Shakor Ka, Siddeh Laba Siddet, Tadaba Lih, Siddeh Hal, Sas Uqayb Qaad, Kulun Kaan Aawka, Somalia Lugu Tul Juma, Mahat Sanit. Thank you, Bishar. And for American Sign Language, we have Mary Herman and Abel Costino. Thank you all for being with us here tonight. So it's so good to be with all of you tonight. I want to start with a thank you to the Coalitions of Communities of Color for partnering us this year to co-host tonight's community um, budget hearing. I want to thank you also for the great work you do year round to address social and economic disparities, institutional racism, and the inequities of service experienced by our families, children, and communities. 
And thank you to the coalition's executive director, Marcus Monday, for being here tonight and for all the great work that the coalition does in the ways that you support Multnomah County communities. I'm going to pass things over now to Marcus to help me welcome all of you. I don't have, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Vega Peterson. Uh, my name is Marcus Mundy. I am the executive director of the coalition, which is a 19 member culturally specific group of nonprofits that work in collaboration with uh, Multnomah County frequently every day uh, to make this community better. Uh, thank you for coming to this public hearing on the budget. It's very, very important that the community participates on this. Um, I would also like to remind uh, the commissioners that this night's convening, it, it represents the power and that government and, uh, and the nonprofit sector are best when we collaborate. So I'm looking forward to a, a robust discussion and just a reminder that that the coalition has partnered with the, the county for decades now, both in uh, our research work with our environmental justice work. Uh, climate justice plans, clean energy. We've done all sorts of things with the county and we look forward uh, to going forward, even with newer things like ranked choice voting. We support that effort. We support a lot of what the county's doing. So uh, I just hope that uh, we have a robust discussion that you hear out from a lot of the community. And thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight and co-sponsor this wonderful event. Thank you, Marcus. And I know I and the board really value the partnership of you and everyone um, with co coalitions of communities of color. So as we begin tonight, please bear with us if we experience any technical difficulties that may arise during the meeting. Tonight's budget hearing is one way that Multnomah County collects community feedback on our budget before it will be adopted on Wednesday, Thursday, June 8th at the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Our second budget hearing will be held in person next Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. It will be held at the center powered by youth building at 16126 Southeast Stark Street. So right at 162nd and Stark, following by our last hearing, um, our last public budget hearing, which will be on Wednesday, May 31st. That one will be a hybrid meeting, so you can um testify virtually at that meeting, or you can come in person. That will also be at 6 p.m. And that will be held at our Multnomah building at 501 Southeast Hawthorne. Um, it will also be broadcast live as this one is. More information about those meetings can be found on our multco.us website. I'd also like to remind folks that written testimony Written testimony on the county's budget can be submitted online throughout our budget process. I know we've already received several written testimony for uh, tonight's budget hearing. You can find the form to submit written testimony at multco.us slash budget dash feedback. Okay, that's a lot. Multco.us slash budget dash feedback. You can also find links to the form in Spanish. Russian, Vietnamese, Somali, Simplified Chinese, and Chukis on the website. You can also simply email your comments, which might be the easiest way to do it, to our board clerk at board click, board clerk at multco.us, board clerk at multco.us. I want to thank all of you for taking the time this evening to be virtually present with us and to share your thoughts and ideas. Hearing from you about this year proposed budget priorities and how they represent Multnomah County's values is an essential part of our budgeting process. Your feedback informs our decision making as we continue working towards an adopted county budget in June that is truly representative of the communities we partner with and serve. The investment in my in my proposed $3.5 billion fiscal year 24 budget are designed to help us continue our regional recovery from the pandemic and shore up the systems we need to build the future everyone in Multnomah County deserves. We meet 2023 with new learnings and opportunities resulting from changes that have taken place since the, the pandemic began. I see these changes as mandates to reset our priorities and partnerships because Multnomah County's budget and priorities are not built in a silo. They're built alongside many jurisdictional community partners and the community itself. Our county is built as much by the community members who call Multnomah County home as for them, which is why this budget also looks at how we can meet a more inclusive, equitable and thoughtful partner. Hearing from you is part of that commitment, so I'm so glad you're here tonight to share your voice. 
Joining tonight um, as well, of course, are my fellow Multnomah County Commissioners. So I would like to invite each of the commissioner to introduce themselves and I'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, uh, I'm Sharon Myron. I am the commissioner representing District 1, which is all of the county west of the Willamette River and inner southeast out to Southeast 33rd. It's great to be with you tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sushila Jayapal, uh, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 2, and that is everything north of I-84. It starts in the northwest corner in the St. John's neighborhood and then goes all the way out to northeast 148th. Thank you, Commissioner Rosenbaum. Thank you. I am Diane Rosenbaum. I am the commissioner currently for District 3, which is the outer east side of Portland. And this is my very first and only chance to participate in the Multnomah County budget as I am serving temporarily in this position until we have elected a new commissioner. So don't forget to turn your ballot in. But I'm very glad to be here tonight and to join everybody and to hear your input. Thank you, Commissioner Rosenbaum. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Lori Stegman, County Commissioner representing much of East Multnomah County. My district begins at about Southeast 148 and extends all the way to the Hood River County line. So it includes part of Portland, all of Grisham, Fairview, Troutdale, Wood Village, and the unincorporated areas. Great to see you all. Thank you, Commissioner Stegman. Um, I also want to remind members of the public that at these budget hearings, um, commissioners listen, but we don't respond to testimony. So it's just like if you give public testimony at a at a Thursday board meeting. Now I'm going to turn it over to our board clerk, Marina Horvis, who will provide a brief overview of written testimony submitted prior to this hearing and to talk through the logistics of the meeting before calling for testimony. Take it away, Marina. Pardon me. Can you can you see the slide up right now? We can see the slide and we can hear you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Today we have 25, 25 people signed up to testify. As of 5:30 p.m., we have received 44 written testimony forms, all of which have been shared with board members and their staff. Um, to listen to this hearing in Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, or Somali, please call the number on the screen associated with that language. If you would like to have your testimony interpreted into English. Please let us know when it's your turn to testify and an interpreter will assist. If you're using the WebEx platform and want to view closed captioning, click on the multimedia icon, which looks like a little pie chart. Um, like the chair said earlier, if you are streaming on YouTube right now, but want to watch the hearing with an ASL interpreter, please email me at boardclerk at moldco.us to receive a link to our WebEx platform, which allows you to pin the ASL interpreters window to the screen. You can also consider using YouTube's live closed captioning function. I will call three people at a time and give them panelist access. Please testify in the order you are called. I will announce your name again after that person before you has concluded their uh, comments. Please keep your microphone muted until it is your turn to speak. After you are done testifying, I'll revert you back to an attendee. Public testimony is limited to three minutes per person. I'll set a timer when you begin speaking and when it, and I'll announce when your time is up by saying time, at which, at which point please wrap up your sentence. Written testimony on the county budget can be submitted beyond this public hearing by going to mulco uh, slash backslash budget slash feedback or by emailing me at boardclerk at mulco.us. Um, let me start with calling our first three, first three uh, folks testifying. I'll just need one minute.
Um, I'm just gonna go ahead. Uh, Laura, can you just get started while I move other folks? Welcome, Laura. Uh, Laura Heller. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners and Mr. Mundy. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight during Older Americans Month. Um, the theme this month for or this year for 2023 is Aging Unbound which offers an opportunity to explore diverse aging experiences and discuss how communities can combat stereotypes. The theme has a strong alignment with the program that I'm representing tonight, Zooming Seniors. My name is Laura Heller. I'm uh, the program manager for Metropolitan Family Services, Older Adult and Intergenerational Programming. As I mentioned, I'm here to request county investment for the Zooming Seniors program that we offer offer. The model that we created for Zooming Seniors supports and engages older adults in virtual co-created communities of peer support. Weekly cohort meetings are facilitated by a program coordinator and MSW interns. Our participants all are older adults who are managing multiple health issues, mobility, sensory changes, uh, social isolation, and other conditions. MFS worked early in the pandemic with Paul Arabino, Arabino, who consulted with us to create this model. We recognize that many of our older adult participants didn't have access to the internet and so many services had shifted over to the internet. So we wanted to create a space for them to be able to gather, provide peer support and also hear about valuable, um, important resources. Our goal then and now is to promote social inclusion and connection and also share important resources that help them remain independent and also combat that social isolation. You may know that the Surgeon General, the US Surgeon General re recently released a, an advisory on um, loneliness and isolation, calling it an epidemic. Um, several key takeaways from the advisory are that the epidemic of loneliness and isolation is a major public health concern. Social connection can, can help to address social isolation and predict better physical and mental health outcomes and also ease stress for individuals and for communities. Finally, we all have a role to play in supporting social connection to create sustainable changes, whether that's on the individual level, community level, agency level, government level, and on and on. So Zooming Seniors is a, is a promising practice. We believe it has great potential to be replicated um, across the county. We currently have five cohorts of um, older adults um, who participate in these weekly um, uh, gatherings. And many of our participants come from lower income backgrounds from communities of color and live in um, under resourced underserved parts of the county. We believe that the program builds group agency and ownership tech skills highlights individual assets. Time is up. Oh, thank you. Um, next, we have Kim O'Malley. Kim, you may begin. Hi, Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners. I'm Kim O'Malley, the coordinator for the Virtual Engagement Zooming Seniors Program. We provide older adults the opportunity to connect with their peers virtually. The participants come from a variety of backgrounds and lived experiences. Some are familiar to Zoom and some it's been very new. What they have in common is the desire to connect with one another have a sense of purpose in life, and a place where they belong, are known, and not being judged. We assist participants with accessing and using technology by giving individuals a tablet or a laptop if needed. We help them set it up, assist with downloading the Zoom app, teach how to join the Zoom calls, and offer additional one-on-one -on -one tech support as needed. Many of our participants have limited incomes, and we have assisted them with accessing low cost internet service and also applying with the affordable connectivity program benefits. 
one of our goals is to help participants gain confidentiality or confidence in using technology independently so that they can participate in telehealth appointments, support groups, and access other online resources and activities. Now, during our Zoom calls, the participants discuss a topic they have chosen. Those who are comfortable assist as co-hosts, and individuals request to connect with one another in additional addition to the weekly sessions. There is peer-to-peer -peer support and sharing helpful resources. This resource sharing is a vital role to promoting physical and emotional health, such as where to get low cost or free hearing aids and how to apply for SNAP benefits. We have provided health information regarding the pandemic, any proactive measures and resources to deal with weather emergencies. We've partnered with OHSU School of Nursing to focus on um, a session for fall prevention and then followed up with visual aid on what to do if you do fall. I'd like to close by sharing a bit about one of our participants. Jerry is one of one who's worked hard all of his life and thinks of everyone, helps others, and has been a volunteer. Now each week, Jerry joins our Zoom meetings often from his bed. When asked about what this program means to him, he said, well, I can't talk, I can't walk, I can't really go anywhere. This is my life, it's just me, my video games, my TV. And I really enjoy coming to the Zoom meetings. I don't Time know is what up. I would do if I didn't have them. Thank you. Next we have Julian Kaufman. Um, Julian, you may begin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, good evening, uh, Chair and, com and uh, Commissioners. I'm Julian Kaufman, and I'm also a Zooming senior. And uh, if you'll excuse me due to a video. Um, Julian, just one second. I think something happened. Julian, are you are you there? I think you just need to unmute again. How's that? There, there you are. Sorry about that. Bravo. Shall I start again? Yes, please. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, well, good evening, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Julian Kaufman, and I'm also a Zooming senior. And uh, due to a vision problem, as uh, I ask you to forgive me, I have to read off of my magnifier. Um, most of my business career uh, involved uh, working with people uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and over the years, I've developed uh, communication skills, which helped me uh, to be more successful, uh, both in business as well as in personal relationships. Uh, then came a life-changing uh, diagnosis of macular degeneration. Um, this immediately uh, required almost a complete uh, life, life change and uh, it uh, it also affected my contacts and freedom of mobility, of course. Um, added to this, um, added to this problem, uh, we ran into the COVID problem and the pandemic, and uh, this offered even more isolation. And uh, then I heard about this wonderful program. Um, through a connection, I had, I heard about the program and uh, I began, uh, I, I cannot begin to tell you how wonderful it has been. Uh, it just connected me with people once again. Uh, further, it resulted, uh, as it was discussed, 
in many topics that we found to be of mutual interest. And uh, these included such things as uh, technical skills, uh, aging problems, um, more resources uh, that would be of value to us, and most important, and I emphasize this, most important, developing new friendships. And because of this wonderful resource, uh, it has made a change in my life. Um, I sincerely feel that to lose this resource would, would be a tragedy. Thank you so much for allowing me to, to participate. Um, next, we have Catherine Kane. Catherine, can you hear us? I'm sorry, Diana, Diane Kane. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. I'm here. Oh, you're welcome to begin. Good, e good evening, Chair Vega Peterson and Commissioners. My name is Diane Kane. I am a participant in the Metropolitan Family Service Blooming Senior Program. Two years ago, I received an invitation to join a new group. Not knowing or ever hearing about this, my curiosity was aroused. COVID was, was active. I was a caretaker for my husband, which made quarantining quarantining, excuse me, even more important. I had to check out this program. What was it all about? Well, the communication with others was now available, and I knew that this was a new world and that the new technology would be here forever. So I registered, and I have never regretted this. From the program continuation, I have learned several things. I have enjoyed the company that I receive each and every week. Our facilitators have been very helpful in training us, in teaching us, and providing us the way that we need to uh, communicate with Zoom. I am hoping that through our testimonies that you're listening to this evening, that money will become available for this program and continue us to move along and continue with our lives. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Catherine Farisi. Catherine, can you hear us? Hi, Catherine, are you available? It looks like she's on mute. Okay. Um, Catherine, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, uh, there you are. Catherine, can you, can you speak? Uh, Catherine, we'll come back to you. Um, let's see. Next we have Okay, um next we have Jocelyn Joss so sorry, Joycelyn Bell. Joycelyn, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. My name is Jocelyn Bell, and I'd like to say thank you to, um, let me get my notes together. Sorry. I'd like to say thank you to the chair, Vega Peterson, and respective commissioners and all the attendees. I'm here to stay, I'm here today to stand in support of community organizations, for example, like New Day. Um, who will be potentially losing 
uh, a significant amount of funding that can impact our most renewable resources, which is our young people. Um, a little bit about myself. I am um, an educator. I have my MSW. I'm licensed to provide social work in, to kids in grades K through 12 here in Oregon. I'm a graduate of the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center. I am a founding member of the Northwest Survivor Alliance. I am a part of the Oregon Trafficking Advisory Committee, um, a part of the Oregon Department of Justice. I am alumni of Multnomah County's Sex Trafficking Community Advisory Board, and I'm a part of Multnomah Sex Trafficking Executive Committee. I'm also a transgenerational survivor of child sexual exploitation, molestation, houselessness, community violence, medical malpractice, and systemic racism on all levels. I've had the honor of walking alongside youth and adults, both in the community and impacted by systems as such the education and the prison industrial complex. I was also raised in a culture where prostitution was normalized and I saw both boys and girls be groomed to be exploiters or exploited. And I just want to say the loss of certain funding can be detriment to our society. Um, you know, it can cause issues with housing. Um, it could, you know, work for prevention. It could provide exit strategies, um, harm reduction, and having flexible um, ideas that are outside of the box. We need to have services and support um, that adhere to that. Um, also, one of the products of sex trafficking, especially amongst our youth, is suicide and suicidality. And according to the Youth Juvenile and Justice Center, since 2009, suicides have outnumbered homicides in youth ages 10 to 17. Also in Oregon specifically, our suicide rate is basically like a point higher than our homicide rate, which is kind of a lot. Um, Oregon currently has an F, according to Shared Hope's um, Child and Sex Trafficking Report card that they put out each year. Um, and we currently do not have a cultured or gender responsive safe harbor law to support our youth. So because we don't have protective factors in place, so. thank you. We need to keep funding for services like New Day. Thank you very much for your time. Um, next, we have Sarah Nadal. Sarah, are you able to speak? Yes. Hi. Hello, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for your time today. And thank you, Jocelyn, for that awesome intro that lined up. My name is Sarah Nadeau, and I'm the Senior Director of Programs at New Avenues for Youth, overseeing the New Day program. I'm here today to request and advocate for an amendment to reintroduce $310,000 to the contract for sex trafficked youth as not just one-time funding, but ongoing. The reduction of the contract will mostly gut culturally specific and confidential services through SCI and UNICA to sex trafficked youth, as well as limit their housing and economic empowerment. Prevention efforts will also be cut. The robust response with these features previously built out will shrink to basic mentorship, some outreach, and some prevention. New Day currently works with over 200 youth each year, and that's a pretty impressive number for individuals experiencing trafficking as most systems and service providers are not trusted. And this is an entirely voluntary program. Our programming capacity would shrink to about 60 youth annually. The wait list would grow and likely need to be put on pause again with youth left entirely disconnected as need outpaces even our current capacity. We'd be left with four housing spots as opposed to almost 20 inclusive of shelter, transitional housing, and individual subsidy. These youth live at the intersection of numerous types of violence and inequity. Thus, committing funds to this program supports harm reduction and greater safety as well as stability across our community related to gang, domestic and sexual violence, child abuse and neglect, as well as poverty. These youth are disproportionately Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized identities. The array of services New Day has been providing integrates numerous priorities from Multnomah County and has been guided by direct feedback from the Sex Trafficking Community Advisory Board. 
The program offers low barrier, culturally specific support from outreach to mentorship and confidential advocacy by folks with lived experience themselves. You're gonna hear more from our colleagues today and in the future. An array of housing options from crisis to stability, economic empowerment classes and individual counseling and primary prevention in schools. Sex trafficked youth in Multnomah County deserve the continued attention, care and security from the restoration and ongoing commitment to these funds. Thank you all for your support over the years and leadership of the Sex Trafficking Collaborative, Chair Vega Peterson, Commissioner Jayapal, and now Commissioner Myron, and for all of your consideration. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine Farisi, are you able to, um, are you able to speak at all? Can you go ahead and unmute? Oh, it looks like you're unmuted. Oh, no. Okay, um, I will, I will keep trying to contact you. Thank you. Um, next we have, um, Charlie Brayer. Charlie, will you go ahead and start? Will you go ahead and start? Yes, hi. Um, hi, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Charlie Breyer. I'm one of the youth mentors and the LGBTQIA 2S plus specialist on the New Day team at New Avenues for Youth, where Sarah, who just spoke, is from as well. Um, I'm here today to advocate for a New Day partnership and request an amendment to the 2024 fiscal year Multnomah County budget. We're hoping that you can reallocate $310,000 towards services for youth who have experienced sex trafficking and commit to ongoing funding for the program. Uh, so right now this money funds all of our independent housing subsidy program, eviction prevention, crisis emergency bed, as well as culturally specific bilingual and confidential advocacy, prevention efforts, and economic empowerment services for youth who have experienced sex trafficking. As a mentor and someone with lived experience as a trafficking survivor, I can say with confidence that all of these services are extremely important and regularly make a huge difference in the lives of the youth we serve. Um, like has been said, it's really difficult to build trust um, with these services and to have as many youth as we do engage is something that I definitely don't take for granted. Um, so this budget cut has the potential to curve services that provide youth the resources, guidance, and stability they need to make safe and healthy choices. We would effectively be losing all confidential support, which for youth, especially under the age of 18, can be incredibly impactful and can sometimes function as the only safe adult in a young person's life. 70% of the youth we serve identify as Black, Indigenous, or other people of color, so the culturally specific and bilingual confidential advocates that this money funds allow us to provide more services to youth from providers that reflect their identities and lived experiences, as well as traverse language bar the language barriers to reach traffic youth we would not otherwise be able to provide services for. I ask that you reallocate the $310,000 this upcoming fiscal year, as well as commit to ongoing funding towards services for youth who have experienced sex trafficking. We ask that you work with us to renew your commitment to ending sex trafficking and houselessness in Portland by funding these programs that help so many young people on the margins. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next, we have um, Marsha. Marsha Nielsen, will you begin, please? Can you hear me, Marsha? Um, Grace, are you available to speak? Grace Henson, uh, Henson. Grace, are you available? Um, okay. Cat, Cat Salas, can you, would you want to speak next? Yes, thank you so much. Hello, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Kat Salas and I'm the Director of the New Day Program, where Sarah and Charlie are also from. I'm also a survivor of sex trafficking and someone, if a program like New Day existed when I was a teenager, would have been eligible. Like my colleagues today, I am advocating that New Day, <clears throat> I'll reinvest in the New Day Partnership and request an amendment of $310,000 reallocated to the FY24 Multnomah County budget towards the services for youth that have experienced trafficking. 
Many of us here today are privileged enough to approach the idea of building a budget as a concept where funds are allocated to causes and abstract solutions. I want to take an opportunity to ground ourselves in the fact that regardless of what we name this space, we are talking about either ending or reinvesting in real tangible services that are currently being utilized by survivors who are members of our community. I am talking specifically about the 103 new people New Day connected with this year and the disproportionate harm of losing money that will happen to Black and Latina youth, youth in East County, and youth who are actively fleeing someone who is trafficking them. New Day is a program that since 2018 has continuously listened and actively integrated the feedback of individuals with lived experience in the sex trades. The programs at stake are a crisis bed, housing subsidy, culturally specific and confidential support for black youth, culturally specific and confidential support that is also bilingual for Latina youth and economic empowerment courses, which are all reflections of what has been advocated to us for by the Community Advisory Board on Sex Trafficking in Multnomah County and the youth in the New Day program. And while I understand the needs of housing, for programs that combat gun violence, for climate change services, addiction services, services to combat poverty feel insurmountable in the state of Portland currently. We must remember that programs for sex trafficked youth are consistently at the intersection of all of these while receiving some of the least resources. To quote you, Chair Vega Peterson, from your state county address this Tuesday, as we emerge from the pandemic into a city remade by social unrest, homelessness, economic disparity, and disconnection, we have an increasing need for a social fabric that cares for our most vulnerable population. I believe we can do that together, starting by reallocating the $310,000 to the New Day program for the FY23 Multnomah County budget. Because imagining a future with integrity and commitment to Multnomah County must include robust services for youth survivors of trafficking like those provided by the New Day program. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm just checking in. Uh, Marsha or Grace, are you able to unmute at all? I can um, send a request for you to unmute, but I can't seem to unmute you myself. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Hello. Um, oh, hello. Hello. Marcia, hello. hello. This is Marcia, and I'm a participating member of the senior Zooming, Zooming senior program through Multnomah. Metropolitan Family Services. I was deeply moved by the testimonials I just heard regarding the New Day program, and my heart goes out to participants in that program. I can feel the depth of how much that program can mean to those participants. I would like also to say that to request that your heart be open to the depth of our needs as seniors to fight isolation and loneliness. Um, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner specializing in senior mental health, and suicide is the highest rate among seniors and also adolescents. And this program has brought new dimensions into my life. It's helped me. I'm permanently and totally disabled since 2010. And without Zooming seniors, well, Zooming Seniors has provided the a most impactful, trustworthy social connection for me. 
I'm going to resort to reading what I wrote. As a participant in Project Linkage since 2014, I am deeply grateful to Metropolitan Services and Project Linkage for the caring, supportive, and humorous relations all of you have shared with me. Also, I surely speak for the countless clients who benefit from participating in your diverse programs. You literally do move our lives forward. Thank you for your compassion as I express how much your staff and volunteers' hard work make a real difference. Your kindness touches our hearts and the time and effort you give to us lucky clients enlivens and inspires our lives. Some of the programs which have empowered me to achieve my highest functional level include classes, transportation, tax filing, weekly Hi, counseling. You, you can finish your sentence, Mar Marcia. Oh, all these interventions reduce isolation and depression. Thank you for your hard work, and we hope you will consider our plea. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to try one, one last time. Catherine Farisi or Grace, are you able to unmute? I'm going to request that you unmute. Me? Oh. No, uh, Grace or Catherine, are you available? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and continue. Alice Johnson, are you available? This is Grace. Oh, this Grace, is Grace, are you available? Yes. Go ahead, Grace. I am available. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was totally unprepared to do this in this way. Uh, I thought that I would be uh, speaking elsewhere and that I had only three minutes to, to talk. So I have practiced uh, trying to be as concise as possible. But I, my name is Grace Henson and I am here to speak and tell why I I'm so indebted to the Metropolitan Family Services uh, Zoom group. Uh, I personally, this is my, my story. I am 93 years old and I have uh, been, I've spent a life of very interesting occupations, uh, many different things, but they were always involved with the arts. And I was always uh, interacting with people. And uh, then when I retired at 67, I still continued the same in the same vein by uh, I was a docent at the Portland Art Museum. And I had a, a studio in uh, Sequoia Gallery and Studios in Hillsboro, where I would go and paint each day with my, my little dog would go with me and we were always interacting with other artists and people there. But at 80, I, uh, things began to change and I had a stroke, which I recuperated from. Then I broke a hip and I recuperated from that. But then I started to lose my eyesight and there was no way out of that. Uh, I could not drive. I was totally dependent on others uh, for all of the services I needed. Um, my daughter and son-in-law were close by, but they uh, could not be with me that often. So I spent many hours alone and it was very easy to finally uh, fall into a state of loneliness and depression. And uh, I, but then I was told about the Metropolitan uh, family services Zoom group, and I was able to join that. 
and suddenly I had a circle of friends that I could look forward to seeing once a week and sharing all kinds of stories. And it was such an invigorating thing to finally be able to uh, see other people and talk to them. And it has been an absolutely invaluable service to me. Uh, I no longer spend time thinking, uh, why am I still alive? Uh, I, and I owe it all to uh, th this Zoom group. So I do hope that it can be continued. I thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you this. All right. Thank you. Next, we have Alice Johnson. Alice, you can begin. Hello, my name is Alice Johnson and I am the housing navigator at New Day. And New Day is potentially at risk of losing a significant amount from our budget, which would result in the loss of several critical, the loss of several critical resources. I'm advocating for an amendment for ongoing funding at the rate that was reduced of $310,000. I am testifying not only as a staff member of New Day, but as a Portland community member who has navigated our ongoing housing crisis as a survivor of interpersonal violence. The sex trafficking community, Community Advisory Board continually expresses the need for safe, sustainable housing for sex trafficking survivors and their families. Within just one short year of being in this role, I have witnessed New Day Subsidy Program answer that call several times. This program provides one year of full rental support in addition to housing specific case management with the option of applying for a second year of tiered down rental support to prepare youth to sustain housing on their own. I have witnessed many successes such as a young woman move into her own safe apartment after an unstable couch serving situation, and another youth successfully transition into independent living after spending a few months in our transitional living program, Butterfly House. Our subsidy budget has also allowed us to prevent at least three evictions in the last year. Overall, New Day has provided 60 survivors of sex trafficking with stable housing and rent assistance. The impact of subsidy reaches far beyond a rent check. I have seen time and time again that once youth are stably housed, the momentum towards their other life goals skyrocket. Without having to worry about shelter, subsidy youth have been able to pursue things such as intensive trauma therapy, buying cars, seeking higher education, maintaining full-time employment, and even starting their own businesses. One youth was even able to leave a long-term abusive relationship shortly after moving into a new apartment with subsidy support. Not only does this program pay youth's rent, it provides youth the opportunity to build crucial life skills. The work I do is deeply personal, not just because I care about young people in our county, but because I have been there before. I moved to Portland in 2015 with my former abuser. I had to navigate breaking leases, losing security deposits, negative landlord references, and property damage, all while doing my best to prioritize my own safety. It was scary, and I navigated everything on my own. A lot of survivors often do. Survivors deserve better than this, especially in a county with so many people who care, just like all of us in this room. The budget cut would also result in the loss of our crisis bed at our Moxie and ALBA programs, which is used to provide short-term emergency housing specifically for youth impacted by sex trafficking ages 12 through 25. Imagining a future of a sex trafficking specific program with no emergency or long term housing support seems bleak when the community has asked so much more from us. Again, I am here today to advocate for the new day partnership and request an amendment to the fiscal year 24 Multnomah County budget to reallocate 3,010. $310,000 each year towards our outreach, housing, culturally specific advocacy, prevention, economic empowerment services for youth that have experienced sex trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alana Aquino. You may begin when you're ready. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, Chair and Commissioners, my name is Alana Aquino, and I'm the DHS specific youth mentor with the New Day program at New Avenues for Youth. I'm here today to advocate for the New Day partnership and request an amendment for the FY24 Multnomah County budget to reallocate $310,000 towards our services for youth who have experienced trafficking. New Day has provided support via 44,000 individual youth contacts 
has had 505 youth connected in Multnomah County and has served 103 new youth this year. Many youth that we work with are able to identify a safe adult within the New Day program, and for many, their New Day advocate is one of the only safe adults in their life. Something I think is special about New Day is that there's an emphasis on building strong relationships with youth in a way that's non-judgmental, boundaried, and strengths-based. I've witnessed the power of these relationships in providing the safety and comfort for youth to reach out when they need support because there's a foundation of trust and rapport. While we meet a lot of basic needs and material needs that youth have, we see the importance of connection and especially for young people and work hard to create opportunities for connection that are safe. Being a partnership between multiple different agencies offers perspective, specialization, and an opportunity for resource brokerage and community connection that's rare. Without this funding, New Day would shrink significantly and there would be added barriers for youth trying to access the same level of support. Before working in my current position, I provided confidential advocacy for youth in the New Day program via our partnership with Call to Safety, and I saw firsthand the importance of confidential services for young people experiencing trafficking. Youth being able to have a space where they can express themselves, process trauma, and talk about their needs without worrying who else will hear is an invaluable resource and one that should not be taken lightly. For many, confidential support means the difference between seeking services or staying in an unsafe situation. Again, I'm asking for the reallocation of $310,000 to the New Day program to support these incredibly important services. I believe youth deserve to have access to confidential and culturally specific supports. Today, we have the opportunity to move forward together or to set back services that have been working for years, and I hope that you will join us and work with us to fill this gap in funding. I fully believe in the New Day partnership, and I see every single day the value that it brings to our community and especially to the young people that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, River James. Would you like to go next, please? Chair, Chair and Commissioners, my name is River James. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at New Day. I'm here to advocate for the New Day Partnership and to request the, the amendment of the Multnomah County budget to reallocate $310,000 towards our services for youth who, have, who are at risk or experiencing sex trafficking or sexual exploitation. My role is to quickly assess the needs of those wanting to access our services, triage support and available resources internally to New Day and through new avenues, the Homeless Youth Continuum and the DV system. It is best when I can make internal connections or warm handoffs to New Day partners. In my positions, I see an urgent and strong need for crisis beds available for New Day clients. Often emergency short-term shelter is the first step towards trafficking survivors achieving housing stability. Losing this funding would, funding would take that away. I 100% promise you that these beds would be in constant use by mothers, single or minors or single parents fleeing a person having been trapped in the cycle of sex trafficking. Through our program, over 505 youth have been connected with our services. Having crisis beds, specifically with New Day, removes barriers to other shelters and provides immediate safety. Additionally, there is an intense need for culturally specific advocacy for New Day clients. 70% of our clients identify as BIPOC and 47% identify as LGBTQIA2S+. Marginalized communities know what they need best because they're the ones experiencing life as that demographic. Culturally specific services reduce barriers that a survivor may be experiencing drastically and creates emotional safety when they may have no one or no other healthy relationships. I hear this need constantly from our clients. I see clients soften when they learn that we offer culturally specific services. Their body language changes, the way they communicate changes, the way they advocate for themselves and move through spaces changes. This is to say removing cultural barriers supports youth fleeing sex trafficking and exploitation or in cycles of abuse. I'm a person with lived experience 
and would have qualified for this program by the age of 15. I can't help but think how this program like this could have been an option and could have helped me cultivate safety, stability, responsibility, and self-sufficiency in my own life. Social programs have been a huge support in cultivating these skills and accessing them was a great challenge. Walking with youth experiencing sexual exploitation and trafficking to develop and maintain these life skills requires wraparound support and stepping up to the plate with resources, funding from this budget, and healthy relationship modeling to secure options. Is, up. Is that time? Sorry. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Brandy Dieterly, uh, Dieterly Radadi. Hi, my name is Brandy Radadi. Uh, one moment, technical difficulties. I am from um, the Immigrant Refugee Community Organization, ERCO. I run the Human Trafficking uh, Survivor Services Against Exploitation. Uh, and I request an amendment for the fiscal year 24 Multnomah County budget to reallocate $310,000 towards new days, outreach, housing, culturally specific advocacy, prevention and economic empowerment services for youth. Uh, ERCO uh, human trafficking services. We serve adult survivors of human trafficking, labor and sex trafficking, and our partnership with new day is crucial because we often encounter people who are not eligible for our services because they have not reached the age of 18 or they have specific um, uh, necess necessities that new day is better um, able to handle. Uh, youth survivors have specific and complex needs that are being addressed by new day. And if they're able, if they lose their funding, it's going to uh, restrict what is available for vulnerable youth to access. Uh, legislation is seriously being considered currently that would mandate sex trafficking prevention curriculum in public schools, um, K through 12. Uh, and so as we are in increasing in our understanding and awareness of sex trafficking and how it, uh, how it occurs and how it affects our youth and our families, um, and we're wrapping up um, education. How it how at the same time are we going to not fund the very um, organizations that are providing the services that those um, survivors who are identified um, are going to need? So um, trafficking is like a, an amputation, human trafficking. It's not like you have a, an injury you just um, recover from. It's like your finger. Uh, human trafficking is like losing your finger. If uh, you can learn how to do things, many things without your finger, you just learned a new way of doing it, but the finger will never grow back. Uh, I was a, um, I'm a survivor of sex trafficking myself. I would have vowed, I would have been eligible for new day services um, had they been around at that time. And it would have kept me from being homeless and for decades of um, of difficulty resulting from uh, my exploitation. Uh, New Day is a, an active partner in several anti-trafficking task force groups, committees, and uh, their youth-based perspective is really valuable in our task force. They really come with a different um, viewpoint and it's so very valuable that um, without them, without having the services that they need, um, I, I'm very concerned about all of the um, vulnerable youth and where they will go. Um, BIPOC immigrant refugee communities and other marginalized communities have specific needs that other organizations are not prepared to give. And as you can hear from all of these testimonies, um, I, I'm at ERCO, but many of these people who are working with New Day are up. survivors themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Tim McCormick. Tim, you may begin. Hi, Tim, are you available to speak? Uh, Tim, we'll come back to you. Oh, no, there you are. Hi. Mm. Hello, we can hear you. Okay, do I have three minutes? Is that right? You have three minutes, correct. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners. My name is Tim McCormick. And I am the director of Housing Alternatives Network, a Portland-based nonprofit that supports projects to help house those most in need, 
such as lowest income households, refugees, disaster displacees, and people experiencing homelessness. This network and my work grows out of my experience for the last decade plus of living in, researching, and advocating for those without formal or stable housing. I would like to speak directly to what is, by almost every account, the number one issue facing the county and the state, the tragic, acute, and chronic state of homelessness, and particularly what the county can do, both in its budget allocation for the next year and in guiding the use of the $200 million in emergency funding on this issue that was recently passed by the legislature. My understanding is that the core new direction for Multnomah County's portion of that funding and in the new joint office funding, as directed by Chair Vega Peterson, is to provide rent assistance to some hundreds of unsheltered uh, people experiencing homelessness in central Portland for one year. From earlier news reports on this, I calculated that the program cost uh, with overhead and administration would come to a, over $40,000 Per household served for this one year. Now, I'm sure that for those hundreds, this plan would be life transforming. However, my concern is for the many thousands of others unserved on the street and also even the great uncertainty of those fortunate hundreds on what they will do after this year of supporting market level rent. I'd like to pose a different scenario and possible use of funding, which I see close up daily in my work consulting to the innovative nonprofit Cascadia Clusters. Cascadia Clusters is presently building cottages for formerly unhoused and in recovery Portlanders at around $15,000 building cost. That is 15, not 50 or 500,000. Cited on faith-based groups properties for around 200 month ground rent per month. They're also hiring and training those same Portlanders to design and build the homes. I see daily the incredible empowerment and transformation of people formerly on the streets now building for themselves homes that could become permanent housing for themselves as backyard cottages or in clusters at a cost far below what others like them will get funded for just one year of rent. What I would like you to consider is how can we put more ships like this into the water and new approaches to be tried and compared for addressing this vast problem to ask what can be done now on a scale of thousands of people, not just to stop gap measures, but on a direct path to permanent housing built with and for them in a way that they can shape and be part of and stay in. Not just a camp or a year of support, but a home of their own, just like you or I or all of us aspire to. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mercedes Elizalde. Mercedes, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hello. Uh, hello, Chair Vega Peterson and Commissioners Myron, Jayapal, Rosenbaum, and Stegman. My name is Mercedes Salisalde, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at Latino Network. I would like to start by thanking Chair Vega Peterson for including in her budget some key community priorities uh, for community safety program offers like 40110, 50065, and 50067 for gun violence response and the Community Healing Initiative. Um, as well as for immigration services, culturally specific navigation for youth and families, all the sun, uh, school community initiatives and in healthcare program offer 40111 for culturally specific mental health workforce development. Uh, I also want to call it a significant program that was omitted from the chair's budget, the family resource navigators. Unfortunately, this sun community resource has been recommended to be cut. This additional capacity has been very meaningful for families to meet immediate needs and plan for ongoing support. Prior to the introduction of the Family Resource Navigator, Sun School providers were able to triage emergencies one at a time as time and resources allowed. But now with the Family Resource Navigators, we are able to do much more than simple triage and instead can create supportive plans and help families thrive and maximize the utilization of resources and benefits that exist in the community, avoiding hunger, homelessness, and preventable illness. While much of our system is ready to move on from COVID, the infrastructure we have built here to support families in navigating complex systems still has a place in community investment. Starting almost immediately after the first wave of COVID cases began revealing the health equity disparities and the risk for the BIPOC community, we heard from government staff and elected officials that we were going to learn lessons from the COVID experience. I heard loud and clear while working at a non-culturally specific organization. And yet here we are and the reasons we are being given for cutting this program, this critical linkage, eliminating nearly 100 jobs and leaving thousands of families without this connection that they have come to rely on is the American Rescue Plan funds have run out. 
We are eager to ask you to find funding for this program, and at the very least, we ask county leadership to engage with the SUN providers to identify a minimum viable investment that would maximize positive impact for children and families. I want to thank the commissioners, all of you who have taken time to meet with our small group of family resource navigators and SUN school coordinators to hear about the awesome impacts of this program, and I remain available for any questions you may have. Thank you so much for all the work that you are doing, and thank you for hearing me tonight. Thank you. Next, we have um, Susan, Susan Harris. Susan, are you um, able to speak? Hi, Hello, yes, Susan. I am. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it came to my attention that a city county gas leaf blower work group was convened last year. And that the works final report recommendations included enacting a ban on the countywide sale and use of gasoline powered leaf blowers beginning as early as June, January 2024. The city county gas leaf blower work group recommended that additional resources will be necessary to conduct education and outreach to ensure compliance in anticipation of policy action by the board of commissioners regarding the work group recommendations. My testimony is in support of funding for the creation of a fiscal year 2024 county staff position charged with those duties. The ongoing danger and damage caused by gas leaf blowers call for urgent and bold action by Multnomah County. Thank you for your consideration of this budget proposal. Uh, thank you. Next, we have Lydia uh, McLeod. Lydia, do you want to begin whenever you're ready? Yes. Um, hello, Chair Vega Peterson and Commission members of Multnomah County. My name is Lydia McLeod, and I'm the Family Resource Navigator for Robert Gray Middle School in Southwest Portland. I'm here today in support of continuing the Family Resource Navigator program for the next fiscal year. Um, I started working with families and students uh, through Impact Northwest in December 2021. Families in need of clothes, food, transportation, energy assistance and bills and more find their way to me. Uh, they find me through the school's community of counselors, teachers, paraeducators and admin who all work together to identify the needs of these families. Um, the more I got involved in the school, the more I was needed. You see, there's a very large wealth gap in the community I serve. Southwest Portland is a more affluent area compared to other Sun schools. Um, however, I'd argue that for the smaller percentage of families in poverty here, the need is even stronger. The Southwest area has far fewer social services available. And for some, the FRN program is the only program of financial or resource support that they have. Also, two thirds of my clients are people of color, which is much greater than the school's population. They face many challenges supporting their students' health and education, all while juggling multiple jobs and the impacts of racism, violence, and poverty, not to mention their own lives and families. My work in the last year and a half has changed lives. I work alongside my families in so many ways, providing groceries, furnishing their home, paying for bills, preventing eviction, new clothes, medical care, childcare, and even connecting to resources that go beyond my reach like SNAP, social security, affordable connectivity program, and more. And in this school year alone, I've provided more than 550 individual services. And that's only at one school and as a part-time job. That could easily be 500 pairs, 550 pairs of shoes, 550 lights that stayed on in the home, 550 grocery trips, or 550 months of rent paid so families could stay in their homes and not stay on the street. These resources are absolutely essential for keeping kids in school and reducing the impact of trauma that poverty can inflict. This budget cut would be devastating and at times life-threatening for those who rely on FRN support. Please stop the cycle of our communities being forgotten. I urge you to continue the Family Resource Navigator Program for at least another year and to better equip our families with long-term support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Ray Nathanson. You may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you. Um, hi, chairs, commissioners, and community. I'm Gray Nathanson. Um, I'm the family resource navigator at Markham Elementary School in Southwest, where I am right now. Um, and I'm an employee with Impact Northwest. 
Um, and I'm here to share that in the upcoming budget process, 90 FRN positions in 90 different schools are at risk of losing their funding. And I'm here to speak to the immeasurable value of this program. Um, the Family Resource Navigator Program has supported over 500 families in Southeast and Southwest Portland since 2021 with over a thousand services that have been provided. Um, and I definitely agree with my colleague, Lydia, um, with the support of my role and the funding of this program, we've supported single parent families, children with disabilities, members of the community for whom English is a second language and have a lot of difficulties navigating many different social service systems that are not accessible. Um, uh, we have supported so many families who are low income and seeking support with self-sufficiency. And in this school alone, there are 17 languages that are spoken in a school of less than 300 kids. I've worked with 75 families in the past nine months, supporting them with housing instability, rising economic costs, single parenting, language barriers, medical emergencies, the loss of young children suddenly, and eviction, just to name a handful of the many of the issues that folks have faced. Um, and of course, the economy keeps worsening. Rent and food costs are rising with no stop in sight. And the support that the FRN program is offering is increasingly necessary. And the fact that it's being recommended for cut is very disturbing um, to me. In many ways, this program has acted as harm reduction. And we keep families in their homes. We help feed people. Just this afternoon, I hosted a family resource food distribution event where over 30 families attended and we gave away hundreds of pounds of produce, groceries, diapers, and more, all of which are becoming more and more unaffordable with rising costs. This program was funded as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just wanna name that the COVID-19 pandemic isn't over and the, the budget cut will harmfully impact already vulnerable families struggling with barriers to accessing necessary services. We have helped so many families. I heard a story just today of someone reflecting how these food days were so supportive when their SNAP benefits ran out. And it really is just the tragedy, such a tragedy that these social service programs continually have their funding cut. It's acutely impacting members of our community that are already struggling um, so deeply. And I want to implore the county chairs and commissioners to consider very deeply how these cuts across all these levels leave already marginalized members of the community at greater risk of homelessness, increased risk of trauma and destabilization in their housing. And time is up. thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate you all being here. Um, thank you. Next we have Lizette. You may begin whenever you're ready. Hi, um, my name is Lisa. I'm right, and I, I'm here to, um, in support of funding for our family resource navigators, and the next coming year of 2024, at least, if not ongoing. Um, I am a parent of two Portland Public School students, and the Family Resource Navigators are important because of their assistance with groceries, gas cards, and gift cards for household needs. Um, as stated by others, um, when food stamps run out um, for families, and that can be very uh, important um, to have. And the assistance helps because systems like um, other systems that are in place can take a long time to get help to the families. Um, systems like 211 um, take longer to fulfill basic needs and provide resources. <clears throat> when parents have more support in all areas, it takes stress off of the children as well as their caretakers. It is great to have someone to go to at the school that knows your children and will support you with wraparound services. At times, schools are the only place where families can turn to for additional support. Thank you for this opportunity to ask for continued services for the community. Um, thank you. Next, we have um, Les Wardner. Les, whenever you're available, you may begin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh. 
I can hear you. You may begin. Hi, Les, can you hear us? Um, Les, we're gonna go ahead and come back to you. Um, we can't hear you for some reason. Um, next up is Sahan McKelvey. Sahan, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Vega Peterson and distinguished commissioners, and my friend Marcus Mundy. My name is Sahan McKelvey, he, him pronouns, and I am the Director of Community and Family Programs at SCI Self Enhancement Inc. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. I'm grateful for the time and work that you put into this process. We know it's hard and long and difficult, and we appreciate all of your efforts. I am here to continue to uplift the longstanding advocacy efforts of myself, my, organ my organization, and numerous additional Multnomah County partner providers in seeking funding allocations that will allow us to pay our direct service staff a wage that would allow them to thrive. The direct service staff of your various partners provide services for thousands of individuals and families. These are very special people who do difficult jobs. But they do these jobs because they love our communities, they love our neighbors, and they love the idea of using their tremendous strengths and gifts to make Multnomah County a better place for our most vulnerable citizens to live. And yet we collectively take advantage of this labor of love that is provided by these champions by paying them wages that often qualify them for the very same anti-poverty services that they are providing. This reality is not news to you. But the opportunity to make a bold statement that can right this wrong does require doing something new. The living wage in Multnomah County for a household that includes at least one child is over 68,000 per year after taxes. This number is up 14% from last year at this time, and our staff remain 25 to 35,000 per year behind even last year's number. We're already behind, and a 5% COLA just continues to push us further behind. These numbers are sobering, but I also want to call attention to the fact that direct service positions at Multnomah County right now have starting wages posted at $27 per hour. The Portland Clean Energy Fund currently has a minimum wage requirement that will be at $28.90 per hour on July 1st. Nonprofit partners funded by the county would love to provide these same starting wages for direct staff, but none of us are funded at a level that allows us to provide wages that are equitable with these numbers. This just highlights an ongoing system of inequity that we have to work together to change. We have to be better than this. If Multnomah County truly values equity and truly wants to disrupt poverty in our marginalized populations, then this wage inequity must be addressed. I know that all of your nonprofit partners are expressing similar realities and similar frustrations, and we truly thank you for listening to us. But my ask is that you do more than listen. Please hear us and please act to change this sobering reality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Les, are you able to speak? I can see your uh, video. I'll, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try to unmute you. It's gonna send you a request to unmute. Maybe Wes um, cannot hear us. It almost sounds like Les cannot hear us. Okay. Can you chat him? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll email. I'll email you, Les. Um, next, we have Kevin Machis. Kevin, you may begin. Thank you. I'm Kevin Matches. I'm a CFA charter holder. My comments directly relate to the, relate to the city rather than the county. I'm here to discuss. The consumption of property taxes by the city as a funding source for the Portland Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Bureau. Specifically, I thought to come here in light of an upcoming meeting hosted by the mayor that includes the county and other local leaders for the purposes of discussing the rising financial burden uh, of those participants on residents. As the county attends this meeting, I hope that they keep in mind that the city has the ability to reduce its own property tax burden 
by approximately $2 billion by my analysis. If you look at any property tax bill, you'll see a line called Portland Fire Police Pension. It comprises about 10% of the total property tax bill. Of the $195.8 million expected to be spent for this purpose this year, 33 million is destined for Oregon PERS. Police and firefighters first sworn starting in 2007 simply go into PERS like all the other city and county employees. A separate city run pension system consumes the remainder and covers police and firefighters uh, in Portland first sworn before 2007. According to the mayor's proposed budget, this will consume over 30% of all property taxes raised by the city during the year. The charter defines the funding policy and puts FPDR on a pay as you go basis. Property taxes pay benefit payments as they come due in retirement, but no money is ever set aside to fund pensions before benefit payments are due. This is a curse on the long term financial condition of Portland. I've been urging the city to request its actuary provide an analysis of a comprehensive actuarial funding policy, similar to the one used by Oregon PERS. The only two places in the United States using a pay as you go approach are Portland and Puerto Rico. I see several benefits to getting off of pay as you go. First, it would improve transparency of compensation. Second, it would move the system towards intergenerational equity. Third, it would reduce cumulative long term costs. And finally, it would mitigate the region's financial risk. The funding policy puts Portland out of line versus peers and best practice. Indeed, Portland has the most costly public pension system in the United States today. On an actuarial basis, it's costing Portland more than twice as much to employ a single member compared to the rest of Oregon, such as your own county sheriffs. Annual property taxes required by uh, FPDR are forecasted to increase 51% over the next five years. Under the current funding policy, cumulative costs of FPDR total $6.1 billion over the next 30 years and over $8 billion through the end of the plan's life. A cursory analysis indicates that one example of a comprehensive actuarial funding policy could eliminate one quarter of these cumulative costs over the life of the plan. That would be a savings of approximately $2 billion, as I mentioned before. A feature of Oregon property tax law called compression means that the city's funding policy does impact the county. Others have raised Red flags on this funding policy, including the city auditor, city staff, the public accounting firm that audits the city's financial statements, and independent experts. Um, please keep this in mind as you meet with the city and the, the other leaders. Thank you. Um, Les, are you able to hear us? And can you go ahead and unmute? Les, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Um, since we're at the end of our uh, public testimony, I'm also going to just check with Catherine. Catherine, I'm going to send you a request. Catherine Farisi, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yay. <clears throat> okay. Um, shall I start the video, I guess? Yeah, yeah, go ahead or um, you're welcome to just speak, whichever. Chair works best for you. Uh, okay, I'll just speak. Uh, good evening, Chairman Vega Peterson and commissioners. My name is Catherine Ferrissey. I'm a participant in the Metropolitan Family Service Looming, Zooming Seniors Program. I received my first computer through Metropolitan Family Services Zooming Seniors Program in October of 2022. The computer opened a whole new world to me. Now I can get information such as telephone numbers, address, hours of operation for many goods and services. I can get information about social services and resources. I can watch OPD shows and documentaries. I can have social contacts in a whole new way. This feature will be especially handy as I am getting older and perhaps may not be able to get around as well in the future. I am connected to two Zoom meeting groups and I enjoy them very much. The group that Metropolitan Family Service made possible, Zooming Seniors, is a high point of my week. 
We know one another now and discuss topics and just visit. They are lovely people. I am getting encouragement to learn to bank online and view my medical chart. I could contact my, elect my elected officials. I could shop online. I could buy tickets to events in town. <laughs> I am grateful to Metropolitan Family Service for this opportunity to grow, to learn, and to have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Les, is there, uh, Les, are you able to unmute at all? Sorry, Les. Um, uh, that that's the end of our public testimony. Okay, thank you, Marina. And less than anyone else who had technical difficulties tonight, we will follow up to see if they're um, and ask you to submit your testimony um, in written testimony. I just want to thank everyone who took the time to test um, to testify tonight. Thank you so much for your testimony. For those of you who did submit written testimony, be assured that my colleagues and I read each of those as we're considering our budget decisions. I want to thank um, again the coalitions of communities of color and Marcus Mundy for your partnership in co-hosting tonight's budget hearing. And as a reminder, our second budget hearing will be held in person next Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. at the Center Powered by Youth at 122nd and Southeast Star. That will be followed by our last public budget hearing on Wednesday, May 31st, which will be a hybrid meeting also at 6 p.m. It will be held at the Multnomah County building at 501 Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard, and it will also be broadcast. Thank you everyone for your participation tonight. Have a good night.